People of God, saints of the Lord, do not be deceived. There is no rest for someone that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There is no way to God without Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. No one can get to God, no one can get to heaven without Jesus Christ as their intercessor, without the sacrifice of Jesus. Welcome to our Evening Wisdom broadcast. Tonight we start a new teaching series and it's a joy and a blessing to meditate on God's Word. Our series is The Preservation of the Righteous. This is a biblical doctrine also known as the Perseverance of the Saints. On this teaching series tonight is part one and we will be studying on how God works salvation in us. It is so important to understand how God works salvation in our lives, how He does His work to bring us, how He brought us from condemnation and hell and will conduct us and guide us to eternal life. So we'll be meditating tonight on how God works salvation in us. Part two and part three, we continue meditating on this wonderful doctrine of the preservation of the righteous, how God preserves and keeps His chosen people to the end in eternal life. Let's open our Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be reading the scriptures on 1 Peter chapter 1 and we'll be reading from verse 3 till verse 5. 1 Peter, the letter of Peter, chapter 1 verse 3 to 5, it says the scripture. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, by who God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The Apostle St. Peter starts uh, this verse, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We start this new series and as we are meditating on the doctrine of the preservation of the saints, also known as the perseverance of the saints, I don't like very much that uh, terminology, uh, the perseverance of the saints, because it may give an impression that we are the ones responsible to persevere in order to attain salvation. And during this series, these three uh, meditations that we'll be doing on this doctrine, the three parts of this teaching, today part one and then part two and three, of the preservation of the righteous, you will understand that how God is the one responsible and how He does the work of salvation in keeping preserving His chosen people to the end. Tonight we are meditating on how God works salvation in us. Our focus in this study is to understand how God works salvation in us and how He preserves His chosen people to the end. The question is now, can someone truly saved by God lose their salvation? Just think for yourself for a moment. Is it possible for someone truly saved to lose their salvation? We're going to be answering this question today based on the Holy Scriptures. 
The other question is we want, with God's help, to answer through this study is who is responsible for keeping my salvation? Who is the one responsible for keeping me and you in the path of eternal salvation prepared for us? Also, what was our condition before the new birth? So, we will also be understanding and meditating what was your condition, my condition, before you were born again. The Apostle Peter starts this chapter basically praising God for the mercy of God. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. The Apostle Peter starts saying, look, we, we have so many reasons to bless God. We have so many reasons to praise God, to be thankful to the Lord. And the reason, the major reason is, look, the mercy of God. And it is so important as we go through this study about the preservation of the righteous, how God preserves His chosen people to the end to receive eternal joy and felicity and salvation, eternal life, in Jesus Christ, it is vital to understand the mercy of God. When we talk about God's mercy, we are talking about an undeserving favor of God. Something that we received that we did not deserve. So when we talk about eternal salvation, how God saves us from hell, from the lake of fire, from condemnation that was prepared, for the devil and his angels. We need to understand God's mercy. And one of the words also used in the Bible to describe the mercy of God is the word grace. We're talking about the undeserving favor of God. It's a favor that you did not receive because you deserve. You did something in order to receive that favor from God. Grace is unmerited favor, undeserving favor. And what this mercy has done to me and you, as this passage tells us, is that this mercy made us to be born again. Jesus, once speaking to a man called Nicodemus, who was a religious leader, he said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, look, pay attention. It doesn't matter if you are a religious leader in Israel. You need to be born again in order to see the kingdom of heaven. So one, a person can only receive forgiveness of sins, eternal salvation, if they are born again. You need to be born again. You need to become a new creature, a new creation, in order to receive everlasting life. So what we are studying this night through this video is how God works salvation in us. You see, it starts with God's mercy. Because we do not deserve anything from God. If there's one thing that we all deserved, if there's one thing that we deserved is hell and condemnation because of our sins. And we're, gonna, we're going to understand how this uh, process works because we need also to understand what was my condition and your condition before you were born again. Because of the mercy of God, He has made us to be born again. Look what it says on, if we see what verse, verse 3 says, Blessed be our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See what this passage says. We were made alive, we were born again through the resurrection of Jesus. For someone to rise from the dead, they first need to be dead. And Jesus was dead. Jesus died on the cross as the gospel reveals to me and you. 
But the Bible says that Jesus Christ on the third day, the Holy Spirit brought him back to life. And this very Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, is now the same Holy Spirit that lives inside the believer. Someone who's born again, someone who believes in Jesus Christ, who trusts in Jesus for their salvation, they have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And this Holy Spirit is the one that brought Jesus Christ from the dead. Is the same Holy Spirit that gave spiritual life to you when you once was dead in your trespasses and sin. We were all dead spiritually, but one day the Holy Spirit gave to me a new spiritual life. And we received from God new life and we were made alive with Christ Jesus. Let's open our Bibles and the epistle of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This amazing chapter that talks about justification by faith explains so much about this journey, how God saved us. But let's read what it says on Romans chapter 8 verse 11. It says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. When God created mankind, He created a man as a three-dimensional being. We're talking about a man who is a spiritual being, has a soul, and live in a body. We were spiritually dead. This means that we were separated from God and we had the nature of our father, the devil. Oh, Reverend, this is so harsh. Yes, but it is the truth from Scripture. And we're going to see so many passages today that can prove our condition before the new birth. Before you were born again, you had the nature, like I had the nature, of our father, who was the devil. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit made us alive. Spiritually, you receive life. Your mind is being saved, transformed your soul by the renewal of the mind through God's word. Your emotions, your will, your heart, everything is being transformed. And this is what the Bible calls the process of sanctification. So you were regenerated in your spirit. You received life. God gave you a new heart. He brought you from the dead to spiritual life. But also there's another dimension of when we talk about us as a spiritual being and also having a soul, but we live in a body. And this body one day will die. But the Bible says, as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that the same Spirit that brought Jesus Christ back from the dead is the same Spirit that will also bring life. As He brought life to my spirit, to your spirit, when you were born again, when you believed in Jesus, you were made alive spiritually. But one day, this very Holy Spirit will bring back our mortal bodies and those who died in Christ Jesus, they will rise again at the return of the Lord. When Christ comes, those who died in Christ Jesus will rise again in glory. It is the Holy Spirit that will give life to their mortal bodies, to our mortal bodies, will come back to live eternally with God. Tell me if this is not some good news. This is amazing news. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. So, Scripture tells us the condition we were, how we were spiritually dead before being born again. So, what Peter is saying in this passage, because of the mercy of God, God made us to be born again to a living hope. And the blessed hope that the... the the saved, the Christian awaits is the return of Jesus Christ that will bring total redemption to us. Both, we're talking about spirit, soul, and body. 
being kept in, in fully perfect in the presence of Jesus Christ. And also, Peter speaks on this passage that we just read in 1 Peter chapter 1, that there is an inheritance that we received from God. And because of this inheritance, we will be kept safe from the coming judgment in this world. So there is a judgment coming. The Bible speaks of this judgment. And those who reject the message of the gospel, they will be in front of the white throne of God and they will be condemned eternally to torment for their sins because they are separated from God. So the Bible says because of this inheritance, we are kept safe from the judgment that is coming to this world and also the, etern the eternal judgment for those who are separated from God because of their sins and by rejecting the gospel. So to understand the preservation of the righteous, how God preserves those who he has chosen before the foundation of the world, we need to understand our condition before being born again. Because we are saved, because we are born again. We are saved and we are born again because of God's mercy. Because God, because he loved us and he had mercy on us. That's the reason why we were saved. The thing is, when we talk about our condition before being saved, before being born again, we're talking about the issue of having a fallen nature. So we cannot, uh, we cannot have the wrong idea that was just a matter of not having enough goodwill to do good deeds. The problem of mankind was not the lack of good works. The problem of mankind is an issue of nature, having a fallen nature. And this is a doctrine taught in Scripture as the doctrine of total deprivation. We were deprived and we were deprived from God's grace. We were separated from God. And this is what the Bible teaches as total deprivation. Also, the Bible calls this a condition of spiritual death. This means that we were eternal, eternally separated from God. And the question is, how this happened? If we were separated from God, when did this actually happen? Why this happened? The Bible reveals to us that this happened because of one person. This happened because of one man, which is the father of mankind. And this man was Adam. Let's open our Bibles in Romans chapter 5. The epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Romans chapter 5. We will be reading on verse 12. Look what it says on verse 12. Therefore... Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So, how did we end up being born spiritually dead? We need to understand that the Bible teaches this happened because of one man, and this man is Adam. In the beginning, when God created Adam, he placed him in the Garden of Eden, gave a clear instruction, and man rebelled against God, disobeyed God, and through the disobedience, they died spiritually. But it was not only Adam died, we all died with him. We were all dead spiritually. And we all know that we were brought into this world and we have all sinned and fall short from God's glory. So it's so clear, as the Bible reveals to us, that sin came into the world because of one man. Look what it says on verse 18 and 19. Therefore, 
as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification. See, one act of disobedience led to condemnation to all men. One man, Adam, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, he disobeyed God's word, he rebelled against God, and this brought condemnation for all men. The Bible says that, so also, one act of righteousness leads to, uh, to justification and life to all men. So now this verse is speaking about another person. He's speaking about Adam in the beginning, how he sinned and brought condemnation to everybody. But also he's speaking about another person. And who is this person? It's Jesus Christ. One act of righteousness <laughs> led to justification and life for all men. Now is accessible to mankind because of the, justifi the, the righteous act of one person, justification, is available for all men. Look what it says on verse 19. For as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. One man disobeyed God and many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So salvation is not something that happens because of my act of righteousness. In fact, what we did in order to be saved, the only thing we contributed to our salvation was the sin that we had in us that made salvation necessary. That's a famous word from a famous evangelist called Jonathan Edwards, great man of God and a, such a great inspiration to my life and ministry. He said that the only thing you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary because we sinned against God. We were born and, and deprived from God's grace. So that made necessary us to be saved. Someone needed to save us. Mankind had one opportunity. And what did we do? In the beginning, the Bible reveals to us we disobeyed God. Adam disobeyed God and because of that brought condemnation to all mankind. If God was throwing all mankind in hell, he was doing the righteous thing. God did not have the obligation to save anyone. He had no reason to do so. There was no obligation in, in, in God to save us. We messed up everything. But the Bible reveals to us that because of one act, hallelujah, of righteousness, and this act was performed by Jesus Christ, the Bible says that this led to justification and life for all men. As by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. We were all made sinners. That was our nature. But the Bible also reveals, so by the one man's obedience. So this is the obedience of one man. And who is this man? Is Jesus Christ. We are saved not because of our obedience. We are saved by one man's obedience. And that man is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore for sending his son into this world. Dying for me in his act of righteousness led to justification and led to eternal life. Verse 20, verse 19 continues saying, So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This means that on God's sight, he has declared me righteous. I am now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Now I am righteous in God's eyes, not because I deserved, not because I did something in order to be righteous, but because of what Jesus has done to me, for me and you on the cross. His sacrifice, His act of righteousness was enough to bring us to 
the mercy of God and to justification and to receive eternal life. So the question is, can someone become good in God's eyes by doing good works? Is there any way for someone in this world who's not a Christian, who doesn't know Jesus Christ, to be saved by doing good works? We need to understand people of God, saints of the Lord, do not be deceived. There is no rest for someone that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There is no way to God without Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. No one can get to God, no one can get to heaven without Jesus Christ as their intercessor, without the sacrifice of Jesus. So we need to understand, we cannot allow ourselves to be deceived by the lies of the enemy. There are so many Christians out there who think that there is a possibility for someone to be saved without Jesus. There is no way. No one can become good in God's eyes, righteous in God's eyes by doing good works. No one is saved because of good works. Let's read what the Bible says in Titus. Let's open the scriptures. We'll be reading Titus chapter 1. Let's read what it says on verse 15. 15 and 16. Titus chapter 1 verse 15 and 16. It says, To the pure... All things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are de detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is the situation of those who are not born again. This is what the Bible speaks very clearly of the condition of the unbeliever. They are unfit for any good work. Nothing they, they do is able to give them eternal life. Nothing that a person does can make them good in God's eyes. And then the Bible also speaks about another lie that people believe, that unbelievers, that people who are not saved, they're looking out for God. Let's read what the Bible says. Are people actually looking for God out there without the Holy Spirit inspiring them? Because no one can look for God. No one can search for God unless the Holy Spirit works in their hearts. Let's read what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3. The epistle to the Romans will be reading chapter 3 from verse 10 to verse 18. Look what it says, the scripture, Romans 10, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, As it is written, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. This is the condition of mankind. If you're not born again, you are not seeking for God. Unless the Holy Spirit is calling you. Unless the Holy Spirit works in your heart. Verse 12. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. And no one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Their venom of asps and under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet is swift to shed blood. And their path are ruin and misery. And their way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the, the condition 
of the unbeliever. There is no fear of God in their eyes. So this breaks that idea that people are looking for God out there. The reason why people cannot look for God unless they are made alive and quickened by the Holy Spirit is because they are spiritually dead. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Look what it says on verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. This was my condition. This was your condition before being born again. We were spiritually dead and we were sons of disobedience. Verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature. You see the issue here. The issue here is not the willingness of doing good. We're talking about the nature. We were all by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So the Apostle Paul is clearly saying, look, nothing you, you can do, nothing uh, an unbeliever can do in order to be saved unless is the Holy Spirit working in their hearts, bringing them from spiritual death to spiritual life. We were all once dead in the trespasses and sin. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the sons of disobedience. So, among whom we were all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this was our condition. We, it was impossible for us to be saved. It was impossible for us to receive eternal life through our good works. But verse 4, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. The question now changes. How does this all change? When everything changed, it changed. And verse 4, but... God, hallelujah, but God being rich in mercy, remember what the Apostle Peter says, the Apostle Paul, they're both inspired by the Holy Spirit, are speaking of the same thing, God being rich in undeserving favor, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. By the undeserving favor of God, the unmerited favor of God, you have been saved, I have been saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. But God, what did God do for us? Let us meditate on this for a moment. What did He do for me and you in order to receive, for us to receive eternal life. Let's open our Bibles. We'll be reading on Philippians. Let's open on Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Look what the scripture says. And I am sure of this, that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion till the day of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. He who begun the good work. What did God do for me and you? He begun a good work. And it is because of this good work that God has started that I am saved, that you are saved is because the work that He has begun in me and you that brought us to eternal life. It is not because we started something. He is the one that begun. 
Hallelujah. But the Bible reveals to us that Jesus Christ is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. He is the one that begins and he's the one that will finish. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is the one that started the work and he is the one that will finish the work. Salvation is of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What happened is that God begun a good work in my life, in your life. That's what Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says. The one who begun, he is the one that will bring that work. What is the work? Is the work that when he brought you alive spiritually, he made you alive, he brought you back from spiritual death. And because of that good work, we are saved. Hallelujah. Raising our spirit from the dead is the good work. Has nothing to do with our works. Yes, we are saved by work, by a work, but that's the work of Jesus Christ. We are saved indeed by works, by the merits and the works of Jesus. That's why we are saved. Hallelujah. Now, we come to the question, which is the subject of what we are studying this evening. Can someone truly saved by God lose their salvation? Is there a possibility of someone who Christ has begun this good work now lose their salvation? And to answer this question, we must believe what Jesus said in his word, what is written in God's word, the scriptures, what Jesus spoke about this work of salvation and how he does this work. We need to believe no matter what the devil says, and it doesn't matter my opinion or your opinion. Probably you have been taught for many years, I don't know, in a church, uh, many doctrines and many things, but believe me, whatever you heard that cannot be in accordance, in concordance, in agreement of what Jesus has spoken in his word. We need to stay with Jesus' word. I need to believe what Jesus said. I need to stay with his word. And I want to show you. I'm going to answer this question with you reading together on the scriptures. Let's see what the Bible says on John chapter 10. Open your Bibles and the Gospel of St. John will be reading on chapter 10. Let's answer this question. Can someone truly saved? And I'm not talking about people who call themselves Christians, but there is no fruit in their lives. Because when someone is regenerated, it starts what is called the process of sanctification. Justification is not a process. Write this down. Justification is not a process. Justification is an act. When you were born again, that very moment God justified you. This means that God declared you righteous before Him. So that's an act from God. Justification. Regeneration. But sanctification is a process. We live a life and we are in a process of sanctification, being separated from the things of this world and walking towards holiness, living a life according to the Word of God and Jesus' teaching, serving God, serving His kingdom in holiness, separated from the works of the flesh and separated from the uncontrolled desires of our flesh and walking according to God's will. This is the process of sanctification. But when we talk about justification, it's not a process. It was an act from God, unrepeatable act, that God declared us righteous before Him. So, can someone who has been truly justified, regenerated, lose their salvation? Let's read what Jesus has spoken in His Word. John chapter 10. Look what the scripture says, John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am 
the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is speaking on a context, the metaphorical language that he's using. Look, we are the sheep. Jesus is the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So he's guaranteeing that those who goes in by Christ, who enters in the door, hallelujah, they will go in and out, they will be saved and they will find pasture. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is clearly saying, look, I am the good shepherd. If necessary, the good shepherd, he lays his life for the sheep. Is not what Jesus has done for me and you? He laid his life. He died for his sheep. But thank God he rose again. And now that he's risen, he is the shepherd of the sheep. He is the one that the shepherd who laid his life, that died for his sheep. But now he is back into life and he's taking care of his sheep. Jesus is taking care of those sheep who belong to him. Can I trust in Jesus? Can you put your trust in Jesus to keep and protect his own sheep? Yes, we can. Jump to chapter, uh, we continue in chapter 10, but jump to verse 25. I encourage you to read the whole chapter. But look what it says. Verse 25. Verse 24. Let's read verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus said, the, the Jews were asking, look, if you are the Messiah, if you're the Savior of the world, tell us clearly. Tell us. And Jesus said, verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The Jews are saying, look, tell us. And Jesus is saying, look, I have said it. <laughs> I've said many times, but you do not believe. So, is Jesus the Son of God? Yes, He is. Is Jesus the Savior of the world? Yes, He is. Has the world heard this many times? We have uh, Christian programs. There are tracts being distributed, books. In the internet is full of, of materials. When it comes to evangelism, it talks about the message of salvation. Is Jesus the Savior of the world? Yes, many people heard of this message. But they do not believe. And why they do not believe? Now Jesus is going to explain the reason. Why people don't believe in the gospel. Why people don't believe in this message. Look what it says. I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. Look. Everything that I'm doing, all of my works, all of the miracles, all of the good deeds, everything that Jesus did and taught, they bear witness that Jesus is the Christ. So there is no doubt about that. Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Remember, he's talking about that he's the good shepherd. He's the one that lays down his life for the sheep. But he's saying, look, you do not believe because you're not part of my flock. You are not part of my flock. You do not, uh, you do not belong to me. You belong to, a, to the thief. You belong to the other one. So Jesus is going back here to the issue of nature. 
remember what we spoke is not about just having a good will doing good deeds to get to heaven if you are not transformed in nature you will never believe because a goat can never can never believe in the true shepherd only the sheep that belongs to the shepherd this is what it's saying jesus is not saying look you are not sheep because you do not believe no jesus is saying you do not believe because you're not of my sheep verse 26 but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep but let's understand what happens to the sheep those who belong to christ verse 27 my sheep hear my voice and i know them jesus knows the lord knows who belongs to him they hear my voice one day that person will hear the message of the gospel like i heard like you heard one day hallelujah the message will be preached and the sheep will hear the voice of the shepherd and jesus says and i know them what happens to the sheep when they hear the voice of the shepherd and they follow me and what jesus do what does he do verse 28 i give them eternal life hallelujah who gives it you didn't earn it it was not something you worked for no you're a sheep you belong to him he called you you're gonna answer you're going to come if you are a sheep there is no way you're gonna stay away he's gonna bring you hallelujah through his voice of love he's gonna call you and when he calls the sheep they follow him and what does he do he gives them eternal life and now he guarantees and they will never perish hallelujah i guess we have the answer from the mouth of jesus christ those who are sheep those who belong to christ they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand i and the father are one praise god praise god we have here the guarantee jesus is giving the guarantee of those who truly belong to jesus christ they have a different nature they are sheep and they belong to the shepherd Jesus Christ and he lays down his life to the sheep but he rose again and he's taking care of his sheep he said look my sheep will hear my voice they will follow me I give them eternal life and they will never perish hallelujah hallelujah can someone truly saved lose their salvation Salvation does not belong to us for us to lose. It belongs to the Lord. Jesus is the one who keeps us from falling. He said, no one will snatch them out of my hand. But as we speak about the doctrine of the preservation of the saints, how God preserves his sheep, how he keeps his sheep and no one will snatch them out of his hands, as we speak about such comforting and amazing good news that God has given to the believer, the Bible also speaks that those who belong to Christ, those who are saved, regenerated, those who Christ has begun the good work in their hearts, can we still sin? The Bible also answers this. Let's jump to 1 John. The first epistle of John, chapter, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you 
so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, can we still sin? Yes, a Christian can still commit sin. Does that disqualify him for eternal life? No, because it's Jesus the one that brings us to eternal life through his sacrifice and through the work that he has begun in us. But there are consequences for living in sin. Yes. But now, can someone who is truly born again, who Christ has begun the good work, can that person continue to live a life, un, an unrepented life of sin? Is there a possibility for that to happen? And I can tell you, no. A person who's truly born again, he has the seed of God and the nature of God inside of them. Even if he sins, God brings him through repentance. He repents of his sin and he comes back to Christ for redemption. Scripture is so clear about this. Also speaks about the false bread and those who never belong to Christ, who never were part of us, but were among us. There are many who are, who are part of churches, who go and attend churches, but they don't have spiritual life in Christ. And they live an unrepented life of sin. Is there a possibility for someone to continue to live in sin or forsake Christ and deny Him forever? Is there a possibility for that to happen? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Let me show you another passage. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look what it says. We see that there is a difference of sinning or committing sins from denying Christ and rejecting and forsaking Him forever. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has, whomever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So, because we were spiritually dead and we were made alive in Christ Jesus, we have se ceased from sin. We have ceased to live a life, a sinful life, unrepented sinful life. But now we are called to live for the rest of this time that we live in this body and the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. There is a desire, and that desire only comes because of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that makes us to recognize our sin and repent and come to the Lord and forsake the desires of the flesh and the passions of this world to live a life in the will of God. To answer this question, we can also go to Romans chapter 6. Let's go to Romans. Let's see what the Bible says to us in this passage. I'll read to you a verse before. Romans chapter 5 verse 21. It says, So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6 verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Are we, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The question that we are asking, and many people ask, you know, can someone who is truly saved, who was reached by the grace of God, who is, who is the sheep, that belongs to Jesus. What shall we say then? Are we to continue 
in sin that grace may abound? Is it possible for us to continue living a life of sin in order for the grace of God to abound? Look what it what is the answer? Verse 2. By no means. By no means. How can we, the Apostle Paul, how can someone who knows this grace, how can we who died to sin still live in it? How can someone find joy and pleasure living in sin? If we have died to sin and God has brought us to eternal life in His Son, Jesus. How? How? You know, you may probably face a battle with sin in your life. And even if you fight till the end of your whole life. Let me tell you something. There is a difference in the believer. Inside in his heart, he knows that he belongs to the shepherd. And the Spirit of God inside them, even if he wrestles with his flesh till the end of his life, there is something inside of him. And that is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is the witness of the Holy Spirit inside of them that will always lead him to repentance. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, in him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There is power from the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us that brought us back to to death and to life. That very same power from the Holy Spirit will guide us to walk in newness of life. We can find comfort in this passage. We can find comfort and assurance in this. There is something that I want to share with you. It comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a doctrinal uh, document from from the 17th century and it says this they whom God had accepted in his beloved effectually called and sanctified by his spirit can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace can we sin yes but someone who truly belong to Christ they can neither or totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. So this comprises very much what this amazing doctrine of the preservation of the saints. But also we understand that even though we can sin as we read in 1 John, and the same confession of faith says, nevertheless, Believers may, through temptations of Satan, of the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of the means of their preservation, fall into grievous sins, and for time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure. So there are consequences. If you are living in sin, there are consequences. And grieve His Holy Spirit come to be deprived of some measure of graces and comfort. So, because of living in sin, we are deprived of His blessings, we are deprived of, of fellowship with Him. There are consequences. Could even bring you to physical death. People can physically die for their salvation. The Bible says in... in the church in Corinth, they were living a life, sinful life, and that's why many of them were sick and were dying. Sometimes God can bring a judgment just to save that person. Look what it says. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith continues saying, it's an interesting, uh, powerful uh, confession that explains this. So, this can in incur in God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit. 
come to be deprived of the measure of grace and comforts, having their hearts hardened and their conscience wounded, hurt and scandalize others and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. So there are consequences. We need to be aware of this. But as we just read in Romans chapter 6, when you understand the grace of God and what Christ has done for you, how can you continue to live in sin? There is no way for the true believer, someone who belongs to Christ, to continue. He can live for a while in a sinful life, but we know that he belongs to Christ and Christ will eternally save them. Jesus said they will never, no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. The Bible reveals that we are saved to live a life of sanctification. We are saved to glorify God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it says that whatever you do, whether you drink or eat, do everything for the glory of God. We are called to live a life for His glory and honor. But also, we are saved to serve His kingdom. This is our purpose as believers. The one who begun the good work in me and you, He will perfect it. He will bring it to completion until the day of Christ. Until that glorious day that we meet the Lord in the clouds and those who died in Christ will rise again in glory and we will receive immortal bodies to live with Christ forever as He promised. When I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you home. So wherever I am, you may be also. So as we are saved through the work and the mercy of God, how He brought us from, a, from spiritual death to be born again to a newness of life. Let us walk in the newness of life. I, I pray that you've been encouraged, and this is all the work of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with what Christ has done for me and you. And once you understand this amazing grace of God, I can assure tell you, we cannot continue to live a life of unrepented sin. Let us walk in the calling that God has prepared for us before the foundation of the world. How God works His salvation in us. He brought us from total deprivation and spiritual death, and He brought us to eternal life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love, which He loved us, He made us alive in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And because He is the Good Shepherd that takes care of His sheep, because no one will be able to snatch them out of their hands, and Jesus said, I will give them eternal life, and they will never perish, because of that, we can be assured that the righteous will be preserved until the end. This is how God works salvation in us. I hope you've been blessed through this teaching. I hope you've been encouraged by God's Word. Here in our, in our YouTube channel, there are many other Bible teachings in our Evening Wisdom series. And I pray you continue to be blessed. And also look forward to our second part of this series about the preservation of the righteous. And we'll be talking about from spiritual death to glorification. This is the path of eternal life God prepared for us. And this is what we'll be studying on our next session. May the Lord bless you and keep you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.